today, it's important that we make an acknowledgement of where we are. We're here on the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people's land. The stolen land of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, specifically right here. Those people, these people, have stewarded the land from time immemorial. And we must acknowledge that we are here on, we are here settled on stolen land. We must take that message to every podium and in every table discussion to remember, as Palestinians, we will always stand with you in your struggle for decolonization. We thank you for allowing us to be here. It is easy to believe anything when you ignore history and the voices of the oppressed. 
It is easy to accept the unacceptable, the atrocious. When you dehumanize the victims of atrocity, it is easy to claim you did not see what is plainly in broad daylight when you actively uplift and support the mechanisms that place the veil before your eyes. That ignoring, that dehumanizing, that veil is for you to live easily while our people are ripped from our lands and livelihoods. That ignoring, that dehumanizing, that veil makes it easy for you to actually participate and support the uprooting of our people. It has always been about one thing in the US, to aid in imperialism everywhere, because it is easier than not. We're here today, as we have always been as Palestinians in the diaspora, here to make it difficult for you to remain silent. Difficult, difficult to go back to your ignoring and your claims of ignorance. In Nekbe, an Arabic word that means the catastrophe has been memorialized in Palestinian hearts and minds to describe the events that occurred between 1947 and 1949 in order to create the Zionist occupation state of Israel, which declared its colonialist occupation one sovereignty in April of 1948. Between 1947 and 1949, upwards of 800,000 Palestinians were forcefully displaced, fled for their lives, lost their homes, their land, their livelihoods, their dreams, their future dreams, as the fledgling occupation state violently sieged and occupied over 400 villages across Palestine. At that time, Palestinians found themselves landless, houseless, and without agency, seeking refuge in the still unoccupied parts of Palestine, in Jordan, in Syria, and other parts of the Arab world. They walked with their possessions, holding and supporting their elders up, carrying their children, many recently widowed due to the massacres, seeking refuge wherever it may be. They found tent camps, temporary accommodations, and for many, only the never-ending road. The fate of 1948 Palestinians, as we call them, was in the hands of others, and their trajectories and displacement was diverse. For many with hands full of the few heirlooms they might have been lucky enough to grab, especially keys to their homes, which they harbored a hope to return to. This was the last time that they saw their beloved land. Them and their future descendants would never see Palestine. Us Palestinians commemorate and mourn the losses, but we also resist the illegitimate narrative of the occupier today. We do so every year, Nekba Day. Today you will hear stories of the Nekba, and what that means to Palestinians here in your city, what they and their families experience in relation to the Nakba, but also how they continue to experience it. I want to express something before our speakers tell you their stories. In actuality, the, the Nakba did not begin in 1948, and it never, ever ended. I mentioned history just a moment ago, and it's important not to ignore. I won't go too, into too much detail now because the information is there. It's, it's in plain sight, it's easy to find. The CSPP actually exists for the exact reason and if you live in the city, you have liter a literal reading library and a learning center to pursue that labor, which is yours to do and we will happily support you to do that. But what I will say is that not, between 19, the, is that the 1947 to 1948 nine mass grab of Palestinian land and the establishment of the militarized occupation state was only made possible due to over 50 years of European colonialist planning and enabling beforehand. Planning and enabling, like the British evangelist calling Palestine a land without people as early as 1841 despite the complex and thriving Palestinian people and their relationship to the land. 
planning and enabling like the British military surveying, surveying of Jerusalem and its surrounds in 1867 and the Palestine Exploration Fund, which pumped London wealth into colonialist aspirations and further surveying. Planning and enabling like the appearance for the first time of USA involvement as early as 1881 with the Blackstone Memorial and clear support for Western influence in Palestine, signed by hundreds of financially and politically powerful USA citizens and presented to President Benjamin Harrison. Planning and enabling, like the Zionist Congress assemblies that begun as early as 1897, and eyed Palestine as well as Uganda for the future site of a Zionist state. Assemblies that were hosted in European countries despite the violent and belligerent aspirations of the Viennese spokesperson Theodore Herzl. And the monumental planning by the British and the underhanded inheritance of Palestine through the Sykes-Picot Treaty in 1916 and the audacity of the Balfour Declaration in 1917 that declared Palestine open to the creation of an occupation state. A declaration agreed upon in Western meeting rooms. A declaration through which Palestinians lost their homeland without any say in the matter, literally while they were asleep. In the 30 years following the occupation, the displacement, the ethnic cleansing came in waves, constantly and increasingly. And since 1948, for 73 years, it has continued to do so. It's important to realize that the Nekbe, the very process by which we are discriminated against, dispossessed, displaced, brutalized, and murdered, is the same in every event that Palestinians experience in occupied Palestine at the hands of the occupation state. And in every event, we Palestinians resist, we fight for liberation, we struggle to decolonize, and persist in our indigenous existence. resist events like the 1967 Nexa, or, the, or we resist within events like the first Intifada of 87 through 93, or in the second Intifada, and every instance of incomparable violence towards Gaza. Gaza, who has been blockaded since June of 2007. Gaza, where absolutely we're an absolute military strangulation and an inhumane siege by air, land, and sea has caused thousands of innocent casualties and is the cornerstone of punishing the Palestinian people for resistance and self-defense. Now, I ask you to listen to the stories. Listen to the stories and the voices of Palestinian people. Free, free Palestine! 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 Our first speaker. Us, fed us, sheltered us, clothed us. 
We cared for it and it cared for us. In Palestinian villages, we lived collectively. Your neighbor was someone to borrow a cup of sugar from, a babysitter, someone to have tea with, a source of protection. My great-grandfather was the mayor of the village during the Nakba. From what my grandmother has told me, he loved his job. He was the person people went to with problems, big or small. And it wasn't that his position had dictative authority or final say on all matters, but we were able to utilize everyone's strengths and knew everyone's needs so we could all survive and thrive together. They protected each other from the settler and state violence caused by Zionist settler colonialism that was invading from the East. Racist Zionist mobs attacked the village over and over again to scare the inhabitants into leaving. There were car bombings, grenades thrown into houses, and Zionist mobs broke into homes to kill and displace the families who lived there. The horror. Striking pain from knowing you can't go home 
because an occupying army and their henchmen will not let you. When I went to Jordan and learned more about my people's history, what she lived through became clear to me. My grandparents were physically present, but their hearts and minds were in Palestine. That was also the first time that I knew our erasure was not going to be as easy as our oppressors had hoped. The goal of Zionism is fragmentation. Fragmentation of unity and pride in our country. While the U.S., Israel, and its accomplices conduct a media blackout on the protests and uprisings happening in occupied Palestine and globally, uh, globally in solidarity, our scattered siblings in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon have been running to the Palestinian border, returning 73 years later to a home we have might have never seen, but we know we belong to. <laughs> collective waking up and it's important to thank where thanks due the struggle for black liberation has always been the leading edge of increasing global awareness against injustices everywhere it is no coincidence that the calls for justice over the past year in the wake of police brutality in this illegitimate country 
has increased people's awareness about the Palestinian cause. And we stand with the struggle for black liberation always 100% as Palestinians. Your phones bring you images and videos of the latest bombings in Gaza. They bring you images and videos of the brutality at the Al-Aqsa holy site in Jerusalem, the occupied capital of Palestine. Your phones bring you videos of the resistance to forced displacement in Sheikh Jarrah and the uprisings all over Palestine. Will you continue to ignore history and the voices of the oppressed? Will you continue to accept the unacceptable and dehumanize the victims of atrocity? Will you continue to claim you did not see what is there in plain sight? No. I think the veil has been lifted, in part, and now is back to the question of ease. We're going to have a next speaker now. Uh, Zohair, are you ready to go or someone else? Zohair, here we go. I'm so proud of you, so proud of the young people. I want to go, sh I want to share just some history to where our disaster started from the very beginning, and I'm going to run through it really quickly. But I want to know how many people know what the bill for promise. Can you raise your hand if you know what that is? Yeah, there's a whole, about half of the crowds here. That's where our disaster in 1917, November 2nd, actually, England decided to uh, just give uh, the Palestinian land to somebody else uh, once they won the World War One, uh, and that's really where the problem started. We, you know, we had a lot of Jewish people in Palestine from day one. Uh, there was no difference Jewish or Christians or Muslim. Everybody lives in the land. Everybody farmed, did their thing, uh, and then they just you just got some. People and then just grew from 9% to like 37% in, in, le in less than 10 years. Uh, and then it becomes a problem. 1948, uh, not that old, but uh, 1948 where they declared uh, Israel as their own uh, uh, land and their own country. And we went to uh, the Nakba. So the Nakba started in to the, you know, 1917. It continues to go on. Okay, sorry. Um, 19, this whole thing started in 1917 and generation after generation in 1948. So my parents were living in Beersheba, which is in the south of Palestine. Uh, and that is where uh, my grandfather uh, got kicked out in 1948. He immigrated to Gaza and then my father had to leave Gaza in 1967 just because there's another Nakba that came in and they took the territory. And then I had to go to Saudi Arabia to live because I got kicked out. And guess what? Saudi Arabia wasn't any better. And uh, uh, I got also sent in here to, I live, to live my life. So as a Palestinian, and I'm sure all of you identify with this, you just, every generation gets kicked out of where they ever put their roots in, and then the Palestinians, we never get back. So any person that declares they're Jewish, they can go back to Israel any time. As a matter of fact, they can take somebody's house. However, if you're a Palestinian and you leave there, there's no going back for you. And that is really where an apartheid comes in. It is really people, you know, people have the power to take other people's rights and other people's uh, a right to live in their place and, and, and prosper. And it continues to go on and on and on. And uh, uh, I don't know if there is an end to it, but the only way you can end it is with this, with this group, with this resistance, with this, with you telling people we are not accepting it. We have human rights and we go in America about, about fighting for human rights. But it comes to the people of Palestine, and we stop. 
we somehow stop that because every we always vote for the human rights, but we see the Palestinian kids and we just look at them for a little bit and go. I'm not talking about this group, but the general population and uh, and just we we just accept that you know they're defending themselves. I keep hearing this thing constantly about Israel is defending itself, but never Israel had actually invoked this whole thing. That isn't. In the, in the news, it's always about defending itself. The Palestinians don't have the right to defend themselves. They're just shooting uh, uh, things and, and uh, you know throwing uh, rocks, and, and we're the troublemakers. And Israel is just defending itself, and that is not the truth. The truth is they are not defending themselves. They're the oppressor. I don't want to take you too long, but I am fourth, I have fourth generation. This is here, my next generation, and I'm trying to teach her one thing. Palestine will always be there. Will always be there. She will carry the flag. She will be one of those people that see Palestine. All and her children, her, her children. We will continue going all the time until that land is back in our hand and we can live like we lived for a long, long time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Viva Palestine! Viva Palestine! Viva Palestine! Viva Repeat after this one. From Palestine to Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. From Palestine to Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. From Palestine to Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. Before we go on to the next speaker, there was over 400 villages that were depopulated in 1947 to 1949. And I wish that we had the time to say every single one of those villages' names. But I'm going to say the 28 villages that constituted around the Akke subdivision lost 47,000. 47,000 people were depopulated from that area. That was 28 villages. And in the Beersheba, Be'er in the south, 19 villages totaling 91,700 people. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Our next speaker is a newly arrived Palestinian to our city. Please welcome Sada.
tortured. It breaks my heart every time I have to go on Instagram and see another child kill. It makes me want to break into a thousand pieces when I hear that my people will never be free, but they will. They will prevail, and Palestine will be free! In the Baysan sub-district, sub 19,000 people displaced out of 40 villages. And all throughout Gaza, numbering over 60 villages, 80,000 people were displaced. Repeat after this, please. Justice is our demand, no peace on stolen land. Justice is our demand, no peace on stolen land. Justice is our demand, no peace on stolen land. I think right now, if we could have uh, Wael. Wael, if you're ready to speak, please. My name is Wael Al Asadi, and um, I want to speak today on behalf of my grandmother, my Teta, who's in Syria right now, a refugee. She's 87 years old. And on behalf of my daughter, Zaina, who all these years later is born, she's one years old. And my family was from Safa, uh, in the northeast of Palestine. Woo! My family, Safad, was surrounded. It was isolated and it was bombed from the outside. My grandparents had to leave on foot. And one of the ways in which they instilled fear in the hearts of people to get them to leave because people were resisting, because people do not want to leave their home, whether it's 1948 or whether it's 2021, is that they burned down the village next to Safad in full view of everybody in Safad the Zionist forces at that time to scare everyone to leave as they were bombarding. And my family left. My teta ended up in Syria. My grandfather lost his mother and his sister in the process because of exposure to the elements as they walked on foot, leaving their homes, leaving every single thing behind. And that story doesn't end then because that generation was dispossessed of their homes and for those of us who were forced out of Palestine, they were left without documentation, without a home. For my parents and their generation who grew up in Syria, who grew up in Lebanon, who grew up in Jordan, who grew up around the Middle East and around the world and were left without a state, without documentation, subject to being removed from wherever they were. My father and my mother had to leave Syria because of my father and their activism in solidarity with Palestine. And for those who have organized here in the United States, their children's children, who have gone on campuses, who've gone to universities, who have said we have to boycott and divest and sanction Israel until it ends its human rights violations of the Palestinian people. The Nakba is ongoing because they call you anti-Semitic if you demand your very basic rights and put you on blacklists. But people will keep on fighting and thank you to all the organizers who put this event on and focused on history. The focus on history is important because they want to shut that away. They want to say it's a complicated issue. It's not a complicated issue when you ask any Palestinian that is in this arena here about what happened to their family in 1948. They want to say this is simply a legal eviction. 
But every single Palestinian life in this room puts lie to what that, that, that is an eviction. We have a name for years and years and years of evicting people from their homeland. It's called ethnic cleansing, so let's call it by its name. And for those whose memory is only one week old who point to the bombs coming out of uh, Gaza, bombs of a people that are in despair, who are in the largest open prison in the world, we say one thing to them, the people who are under occupation, who have been assaulted and ethnically cleansed for years, have a right to resist. And we know they lie about their worry about violence. Because when we say this country can end things overnight by stopping their billions in weapons and support for Israel, we call that the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. They attack us. And I've been to many demonstrations now for 15 years, and it's, it's, I, I think there is something different happening today. What's different is not the absolute depravity of the Israeli state's actions. That is continued. Our parents, our grandparents um, know about that. And we have been to many protests uh, to, to, to resist this. But what has changed, it feels like, is the level of resistance of the Palestinian people, who I think are waking up again after years in every single part of the Palestinian population. We are seeing protests in the West Bank, in Gaza, inside of 1948, the Israeli citizens of Palestinians, which is scaring them because they say that Israel is a democracy, but that is putting lies to that, to that, that is showing how big of a lie it is. And I will just end with this. The Palestinians are resisting. People in Baghdad, Baghdad are out, in Iraq, people in Jordan are out um, in, in defiance and people across the United States, and what we do here matters. The United States is the single largest backer for the Israeli state, militarily, economically, morally, and shame on Biden for vetoing that resolution saying that Israel needs to stop. Shame on the Biden administration that the only thing out of their mouths as children are being killed is that Israel has a right to defend itself. But that is not the only voice out there. There are our voices in the streets, and there was Rashida Tlaib, the first Palestinian woman in Congress, who gave a beautiful speech. Not one more penny to the Israeli state until Palestine is free. In Haifa, northwestern sub-district, 60 villages were depopulated, totaling 120,000 Palestinians. In Hebron, which we say Khalil, 16 villages with 23,000 people that depopulated. Repeat after this, free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long love the Intifada! Long live the Intifada! Long live the Intifada! Intifada, Intifada! Intifada, Intifada! Let's have uh, Jet. Wanted to say a couple words, please. Hello, everybody. 
You know, I didn't prepare anything when I came here. I had only one thing to say. You know, Martin Luther King once said, a man dies when he refuses to stand up for what is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for the truth. The United States is supporting Israel because of what? Money, power, and that. But we are here because we're not slaves to the money. We are here because we are people of dignity. And we will stay people of dignity until we die. In Janine, the Janine sub-district, eight villages, 4,000 people. What I haven't mentioned in the past sub-districts sub that I mentioned to you were the massacres. So I'd like to go back because that's part of the, what has happened to us. In Be'er Seba, we underwent one large massacre. In Akke, eight massacres. In Baysan, one massacre. In Gaza, six massacres. Haifa, ten massacres. Khalil, two massacres. Yeah, it's on there. We're going down. Next speaker, before we go to the next speaker, let's again say, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Please welcome Ruben. everyone I just wanted to thank you all for coming today I wrote this speech while I'm in tears and I hope I can complete it as of right now a Palestinian man called Muhammad Hadidi met his two months baby, the only survivor for his family that killed an Israeli airstrike, which bombed the family home in a refugee camp in Gaza last night. Muhammad's wife and his four kids were killed in the massacre. He saw his wife and his kids in pieces. Wasin, Wasin were they killed for? Wasin were they killed for? It was Eid. They were still wearing their Eid's clothes. In 1948 was the Nakba, and today we're living it all over again. Israeli Zionists are acting like Nazis. Come and get me. I'm a Palestinian woman and I'm here. Come and get me. I'm speaking the truth. <laughs> I'm not going to tell the world what to believe and what not. Stop the crocodile tears. We are Palestinians and that is our land. And we have nothing to lose. We have nothing to lose. We will resist until our last breath. Palestinians and especially Gaza doesn't have an army, does not have an army. Israel is sending an army into Gaza to, find, to fight people who literally do not have an army to fight back with. What war is this? This is not war. This is genocide. The 
they wanted us to live in peace, but that's not happening. It all started at the beginning of the holy month Ramadan. Exactly one month ago, Israel blocked off access to the Al-Aqsa Mosque for Palestinians and nearby settlers. They were supported by the state who, who were also trying to forcibly steal Palestinians' home in Sheikh Jarrah, as you all know, as, and as you all saw the videos. Sheikh Jarrah, which is home to 3,000 Palestinians that would make an entire families homeless in a pandemic. So this colonial violence has been happening because both Israel and settlers know that their state allows them to carry weapons and assault Palestinians in their, no in their neighborhoods and their own homes, in their own homes, in front of children, women. Let that sink in, coming into your own home, peacefully sitting there and kicking you out, using weapons and guns, terrifying the children, and you don't want us to, and you don't want us to fight back? What is this? but this is the last thing I'm going to end up with. We will do everything, everything to take care of our mosque, to take care of Palestine, to free Palestine. But they come to us while peacefully praying, using steel bullets coated with rubber. They fire tear gas into the mosque. And lastly, throwing white phosphorus. Do you guys know what white phosphorus is? Yes. Throwing it in the, in the homes, throwing it at children. Children are it's burning, their faces are burning. This, it's internationally, it's internationally illegal white phosphorus. Free Palestine. The 36 villages that make up Yaffa, 123,000 people displaced in two massacres. The six villages and cities that make up Jenin, 4,000 people massacred, 4,000 people displaced in one massacre. Remember, this is just in 47 to 1949. Next, we're going to have Dr. Hnedi speak about uh, something that she's working on. Oh, actually, first we have an Arabic statement. An Arabic statement to be made. <laughs> Thank you. تداعى على 
له سائر الجسد من سهر الحمى الاحتلال يقوم بتدنيس المسجد الاقصى وقصفه وتكسيره واحراق القران الكريم اليست لديكم غيره على دينكم اذا لم تشعر بالقهر والالم لمسجدك الذي يدنس وقرانك الذي يحرق فرجاء لا تسمي نفسك مسلما سمي نفسك ما شئت لان المسلمين يعلمون ان هذه مقدسات وعقيده يجب الحفاظ عليها ولا يمسها الا المقهرون اريد ان اخبركم معلومات بسيطه عن فلسطين فلسطين دوله عربيه عمرها الاف السنين بسبب الاحتلال الاسرائيلي وبسبب تحكمه باغلب المناطق في فلسطين تم فرض قوانين على الفلسطينيين بعضها لا يسمح ان للفلسطينيين ان يسافرون خارج البلاد ولا يسمح لهم بالتنقل بين المحافظات في داخل البلاد ولا يسمح بفتح المعابر بين غزه والدول الاخرى ولا يحق لغزه الحصول على الكثير من الاشياء البسيطه كالالكترونيات الحديثه والطوب الحامي من الرصاص والبنزين الكافي لاناره المدينه لا يسمح لاي عربي بالدخول لفلسطين الا اذا كان حاملا الجوازات المسموحه بها لدخول الاراضي المحتله من قبل الاحتلال الاسرائيلي والكفتين من القوانين الظالمه بحق الفلسطينيين قبل انتهاء رمضان بعدة ايام قرر الاحتلال اخراج سكان حي الشيخ جراح من منازلهم التي لا يملكون التي يملكونها من مئات السنين واسكان المواطنين المستوطنين فيها بدلا عنهم تخيل ان هذا يحدث في في منزلك انت ان ياتي شخص ويقول لك اخرج انا ساسكن في هذا المنزل الان نعم هذا ما يحصل في شيخ الجراح قبل قليل قلت لكم القوانين المفروضه على الفلسطينيين عندما يخرجون الناس من هذه البيوت اين يجب ان يذهبوا يسافروا خارج البلاد ممنوع يسافرون بين المحافظات ممنوع ماذا تريدون ان يفعلوا في غزه يوجد تقريبا 200 مليون شخص في مساحه اصغر من 150 كيلو متر مربع ولانهم لا يستطيعون السفر خارج غزه يحتاجون لمباني كبيره مباني سكنيه طويله ليتم استيعاب العدد الكبير في غزه ماذا يفعل الاحتلال الاسرائيلي الان يقوم بقصف هذه المباني الكبيره لقتل اكبر عدد ممكن من الغزاويين طبعا سيذهب المسعفون لانقاذهم من يستطيع لإنقاذ من يستطيعون انقاذهم ويأخذونهم الى المشفى ماذا يفعل الاحتلال الاسرائيلي يقوم بقصف المشافي التي تعالج الجرحى هذا احتلال قاتل ارهابي يتهم المدنيين العزل بالجرحى بامتلاكه بالسلاح نعم هذا جزء بسيط جدا مما يعيشه الفلسطينيون جوجل قامت بمسح اسم فلسطين من خرائط جوجل وتغييره لاسم اسرائيل وتم مسح محافظة غزة من خريطة اسرائيل نظام اندرويد الحديث قام بحذف علم فلسطين من الايموجي الولايات المتحدة تجدد الجوازات للفلسطينيين ولا يسمح لكتابة اسم فلسطين على جوازهم يجب ان يكتبوا اسرائيل فيسبوك وانستغرام يقومون بحذف المنشورات والصفحات والهاشتاجات التي تقطع جرائم الاحتلال يقومون بتقليل عدد الاشخاص التي يمكنهم رؤيه المنشورات الداعمه للقضيه الفلسطينيه يريدون ان يمحوا حقيقه وجود دوله فلسطين ويفرضون على الفلسطينيين التقبل من الاحتلال الاسرائيلي في الختام اريد ان اختم بعدد ضحايا لهذه الحرب حتى الان الاجمالي 140 شهيد الاطفال 39 شهيد النساء 22 شهيدة المصابين أكثر من ألف جريح البارحة تمت إبانة عائلة كاملة لم يبقى منها إلا الأب وإن طفله الرضيع البارحة كان هناك شخص صور الجرحى والشهداء القادمين للمشفى انصدم بوجود اثنين من إخوانه ضمن الشهداء لم يعرف ماذا يفعل صديق لي في غزة قال لي لا تقلقي علي لا تقلقي علي إذا حدث لي شيء هناك من سيخبرك بذلك تم تبانة عوائل كثيرة في غزة في الأيام الماضية تحدثوا انشروا فضائح الاحتلال إذا كنتم خايفين من الموت تذكروا أنكم ستموتون على أي حال هذه هي سنة الحياة إذا متم بسبب وقوفكم على الحق ورفضكم الظلم ستموتون موتة الشرفاء إذا متم وأنتم ساكتون على الحق راضين بالظلم على غيركم هذا يجعلك أنت والظالم في نفس المكان كأنك أنت من قتلت أيضا لا تجارك في جرائم الاحتلال عن طريق سكوتك عن الظلم قد تقول المنشورات والهاشتاجات لا تفيد لكن اخبرك بانك 
district that makes up over 70 villages and cities. 100,000 people were displaced and 10 massacres occurred. In Nazareth, in Nasira, five villages, five cities, 9,000 people displaced, one massacre. Repeat after this, please. From Palestine to Mexico, border walls have to go. From Palestine to Mexico, border walls have got to go. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Dr. Hnedi, please. Hello, trying uh, to just recite some lines actually to be concise and right to the point. This is going to be the intro of my coming up book. Really? Even though our clay is made from our land, they want us to strand. They want to destroy our yesterday, and they still occupy, kill, and bind us today. They hold us accountable for their melancholy, even worse. They take revenge by causing us an ongoing catastrophe. They are changing our demography, our topography. Yes, they've plundered our history, time and place, but we will never surrender our place. In the Jerusalem sub-district that makes up some 70 villages and cities, 98,000 people were displaced and three massacres. And in the Safad sub-district, which made up over 60 villages and cities, 60,000 people displaced and 10 massacres. Repeat. From Portland to Gaza, globalize the Intifada. Portland to Gaza, globalize the Intifada. From Portland to Gaza, globalize the Intifada. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. We've got a speaker from Jerusalem who'd like to speak. actually said some of the the speaker who spoke in Arabic said some of the things that I was intending to talk about um, I don't have a speech prepared uh, I just have a few things um, I'm I moved here nine years ago and um, the first thing I knew uh, was that the topic of Palestine outside of uh, my door, outside of my home, was a taboo here in the U.S. And I just want to say that this brings me so, so much life 
to see all of you right now. And I also want you to know that each and every single one of you that is posting one single post that is speaking the truth is more important than you can ever, ever imagine. Those of you who are following the live feed, who, those who are following Instagram and who are following what's going on will know that every single person who is right now speaking up, they're not the politicians, they're actually Palestinian Arab, Palestinian and Arab and social media influencers on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube. They are the ones that literally brought this to all of us to hear. So, one of the things that have been happening and that will happen and is happening right now is there's going to be a huge media blackout that's already started. Their Instagram is taking down posts. It takes down live feeds as they are coming out. They, you will literally see them fall like from Instagram. The people who are raising the banner and, and, and saying that things are happening. Like these are the reason you hear and see about what's going on, the videos, the all of this started because pe people reached out to people on social media. And every person in Gaza is literally, literally sacrificing their life to bring you that picture. I cannot. If you're not going to share, just bear witness. Just go and open that feed and look at what's happening because I cannot believe that people died and got shot while I was watching them. I cannot believe that the difference between my brother in Jerusalem being dragged out of his car and the person he filmed was a road. That's it. My brother yesterday filmed people attacking a car and the soldier who looked at him threw a grenade at him, he kept like, and then he filmed a person that was being arrested. Again, that's in my neighborhood. <laughs> that's literally in my neighborhood. Um, I said that on, I said that a couple of times before, but one of the main things is, well, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm very nervous, so. I'm going to be sharing with them accounts of people who are on the ground from Sheikh Jarrah, from Gaza, from Jerusalem, from Haifa, Akkalid, like everybody that I know, I will be sharing them. Watch, share, like get smarter like we're trying to get smarter. One of the things you can do is if you see a video, save it, save it, like not only like it and share it, save it before it gets taken down. They are, the word Israel is a flag for Instagram. There are words, the word resistance in Arabic. They are literally taking down accounts of the person who started the hashtag Save Sheikh Jarrah. Any post that I post for her will be, like you guys will see it as a sensitive content even if she has a heart in it. That's what's happening. There's, so social media, like the people in Palestine Literally, like I'm watching the feeds and they say, this, this is what's bringing them life. We have no army, we have no police, we have nothing. We have literally the soldiers and the police, like having the settlers be the first line so that they don't look back to the media. So like in Yaffa, a family got burnt last night. They threw Molotov cocktails in their home. I'm, I'm speechless, like, so please, just share it on your Facebook, share it on Twitter, like, keep, keep this alive, because soon enough, because you hear what the governments are saying, 
you hear what they are doing? Nothing. So please, we're alive because y'all are alive with us. One, two. And speak up. To speak up. This is the time to speak up. for us and for all of humanity. In the Tiberias subdistrict that includes the Galilee, 30,000 people were displaced in five massacres. <laughs> From Iraq to Palestine, occupation is a crime. From Iraq to Palestine, occupation is a crime. From Iraq to Palestine, occupation is a crime. Free, free Palestine. 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 Next speaker, Leila. Um, this is amazing. This is really, really, truly incredible. For all of us that have been speaking out about Palestine, that have seen our families arrested, murdered, displaced, it's, it's great that people are finally standing up against this injustice. We can't do this alone, so I thank you. I thank you for being here. As you heard, there are parallels between all of our stories. My family, my family is also from El Abbasiye, as Hanna also spoke about earlier today. My great-grandfather and my great-grandmother were displaced from their homes. My grandparents were displaced from their homes. The ones that they lived on for, lived in for hundreds and hundreds of years. They tilled the land for hundreds and hundreds of years. They have had lives and families raised in these lands and to be illegally evicted and displaced from their homes <laughs> over and over. My great-grandmother still owns the deed, still has the deeds and the keys to her home in El Abbasiye, which is now an Israeli Thank town so called El Hudiye. There are no Palestinians that live there. My great-grandmother cannot return even though she is the legal owner of her home. She has been through four major wars. She has lived through occupation, and I pray, I pray that in her lifetime, Palestine will be free. I see the devastation of the Nakba every day. I see it in my family living in a refugee camp in Amman. I see it in my grandmother's struggle to survive in a refugee camp in Jalazon near Ramallah. I see it in my family who are no longer afraid of the nightly raids that the Israelis undertake. They throw grenades into the neighbors' houses. They arrest people. I, and they make fun of me for being afraid when I'm there. They say, how can you be afraid? This happens every day. That is startling in and of itself. That is a horrifying thing to normalize. That your sons could be arrested. That your house could be, have grenades thrown into it. The fact that they are normalized to that is what's really, really startling. We are a fragmented group. You see that in Gaza where they cannot enter or leave because of the Israeli siege. You see that in the West Bank, where they need permits to travel throughout the occupied territories. When my cousin was arrested, my family couldn't go visit him because they couldn't obtain the proper permits. He was arrested for two years and they couldn't see him. It's much easier to control us now that we are scattered across the world. There are seven million Palestinians living in the diaspora. That's seven million people that are denied the right to return to their homeland. This is all a direct result of the Nakba. This is all a direct result of the illegal establishment of Israel in Palestine. This is the Nakba. Every single bombardment, every single arrest, every single murder and eviction that 
is because of Israel's establishment. So where do we go from here? You hear these stories, you see the parallels. I just, I hope that you can ask yourself these questions. How have you all, generalizing here, but how have you all stayed silent for the 73 plus years that the Nakba has been going on? How has Israel and the U.S. been so successful in their campaign to dehumanize Palestinians to the point that it is, their killing is justified? For 73 years, the same cycle of violence has happened over and over and over. We see it in America as well, with black Americans being shot in the street. This has to end. 73 years is too long. 100 years is too long. I am, in a weird way, I'm privileged to live in the diaspora. Yes, that means I'm disconnected from my home, but that also means that I am not living under occupation and constant aggression. And because of that, it is my responsibility to educate people. It's my responsibility to my great-grandmother, to my grandfather, to my dad, to my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. It is my responsibility. And I know that a lot of other Palestinian Americans feel the same way. makes us easy targets. That means that if we are the only ones educating people about Palestine, that we will be blacklisted. We will be put on the Canary Mission. We will not be allowed back in to the West Bank to see our family. That's why you all have to speak up. This can't fall on Palestinians anymore. Make it impossible for the U.S. and Israel to silence us. No longer can we be reactive. We can't wait for these events to happen and then respond. We need to be proactive in our actions. Enough with justice postponed. We demand justice for Palestine. We demand justice for black Americans. We demand justice for the indigenous populations all across the world that are subject to ethnic cleansing. crisis that we're in and it demands political solution. End the Nakba. End catastrophe for Palestinians. This cannot go on. Boycott Israeli products. Divest from Israeli institutions and sanction Israel. Palestine will not and cannot be free in isolation. We need you all. Thank you. And lastly, on the list of the sub-districts, we're not done yet, we have a lot of speakers. In Tulkaram district, 17 villages, 20,000 people displaced, and a recorded massacre. That's 804,000 people that were displaced between 1947 and 1949. I wish I could say all the names of the villages that make up the over 400 villages, but that was just a summation of them. Repeat. Netanyahu, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Netanyahu, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Netanyahu, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Netanyahu, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Free, free Palestine. 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 Our next speaker, please, Libya. Alright, we're gonna do a new chant, so wait for me to tell you the whole thing and then join in, okay? It goes, No to annexation! No to occupation! Yes to liberation! Bring the whole thing down! No to annexation! No to occupation! Yes to liberation! Bring the whole thing down! No to annexation! No to occupation! Yes 
occupation. Go to occupation. Yes, to liberation. Bring the whole thing down. One more. No to annexation. Go to occupation. Yes, to liberation. Bring the whole thing down. Yes, thank you. My name is Olivia. I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. I am also the North America coordinator for the BDS movement. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So we're here today to listen to stories of the Nakba, the catastrophe, which we know uh, is ongoing. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine has never ended. Um, I want to tell you some things you can do about it. Um, how many of you are here at an action for Palestine for the first time ever? Can I see some hands? Amazing, welcome, thank you for being here. I think it's really great that there are so many people out here today. There are so many actions happening today across the United States. Uh, we have statements of solidarity from celebrities and politicians like never before. Our own Bosnian beast, Yusuf Nurkic, Portland Trailblazer, spoke out for Palestine. Thank you, Nurkic. Uh, but we also need more than just statements of solidarity. And actually, we need to put our solidarity into action. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So BDS, for those who don't know, stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. It's a call from Palestinian civil society. Palestinians got together in Palestine in 2005 um, to issue this call for the international community. The BDS call is modeled off the South African anti-apartheid movement. And Palestinians are calling on us as the international community uh, to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel until Israel complies with international law by meeting three demands. Number one is ending the occupation and dismantling the illegal apartheid wall. Number two is full equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel. And number three is the right of return for Palestinian refugees. of the BDS call, and you can think of it like a picket line. For those of us who are familiar with the labor movement, uh, we would never cross a picket line if workers there were on strike, you know, until their demands were met. Um, and you can think of BDS the same way. We don't cross the picket line. Uh, why BDS is important is because it can take us from sympathy to action. It's very easy to say we sympathize with the Palestinian cause, we're in solidarity with the Palestinian cause, but there is something you can actually do, and that's ending the complicity of our government and institutions right here at home. Uh, the United States gives $4 billion a year in military funding to Israel, no strings attached. Yes, and, and people say the BDS movement singles out Israel, which is like, Yes, of course, because it's a call from Palestinians. Like, why, why would they not be uh, calling on people to boycott Israel? Um, but the United States is actually the one singling out Israel by giving them $4 billion a year in unconditional funding. Um, so one way we can engage in BDS is to end this funding. So I want to give you all a link. You can either write it down, remember it. Um, it is bit slash ly bit.ly. Um, sorry, bit.ly slash rise up with Palestine, and the first letters of those words are capitalized, bit.ly slash rise up with Palestine. Um, that will take you to an action page where you can urge our members of Congress to end U.S. military funding to Israel. Um, and we can shout out Representative Earl Blumenauer, who signed on to Betty McCollum's legislation, which will condition some funding um, to Israel. So thank you, Earl. But he can be pushed a lot further to actually end U.S. military funding to Israel. Um, and the rest of our congressional delegation here needs a huge push because a lot of them continue to demonize Palestinians and BDS. And they need to hear from you all because you elected them, they are supposed to represent us, and we do not want them to use our tax dollars on ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. At the city level here in Portland, our city has a $10 million contract with G4S for security guards right there at City Hall. Um, G4S was recently just bought by Allied Universal, which um, G4S has a terrible reputation. They're complicit in a wide array of human rights violations all over the world, including detainment and transportation of undocumented immigrants here in the United States. Um, and they used to do a, re a lot of really messed up stuff in Palestine. They used to help run prisons and the military checkpoints uh, and the apartheid wall. They actually got out of most of that thanks to BDS pressure, um, but they still partially own and operate the Israeli National Police Academy. So all the videos that are being shared right now of Israeli police and the Israeli border police throwing grenades into Palestinian homes, repressing protesters, 
uh, protecting and encouraging settler violence, those police were trained at the G4S Police Academy, which is the same G4S that our tax dollars here in Portland pay to be at City Hall. Uh, so this is a demand that we can win locally to get our city to stop contracting with G4S. Um, and there's actually a group of us who's working on a, a procurement policy to prevent the city from contracting with corporations who commit human rights abuses in Palestine and all over the world, like G4S. So email me at olivia at bdsmovement.net if you want to get involved in that, because that is a demand we can win right here in Portland. Um, another action we can take right here in Portland is ending the deadly exchange. The deadly exchange is a term uh, coined by Jewish Voice for Peace that describes police exchanges between the United States police forces and Israeli police and military. Our own former police chief, Danielle Outlaw, I don't know who remembers her, uh, she went on one of these exchange trips. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen what she's up to in Philly right now, but it involves a lot of tear gas. Uh, American police have always been brutal and racist, we know that, so, so I don't want to you know, feed into the trope that these trainings are causing American police to be brutal and racist because they were brutal and racist long before Israel existed. But it does escalate and train the, in them in certain tactics of surveillance, of racial profiling, of, of crowd control, of treating an entire civilian population as enemy combatants. That is what they're learning. These trainings are billed as counter-terror trainings, uh, and those of us in the Arab and Muslim communities know what counter-terror means. Uh, it means surveil and, and violate our rights and brutalize us. Uh, so U.S. police learn these tactics from Israeli police and then come here and use them right here on our streets, especially at protests. And on these trips, they actually visit the Israeli National Police Academy that is owned and operated by G4S. Uh, so it is all connected. Uh, the Deadly Exchange is a BDS campaign we can take up in Portland. Um, Durham, North Carolina, had their city council passed a resolution to end these exchanges. Charlottesville, Virginia just passed a resolution to end these exchanges. And so there is no reason why we can't pass the same sort of resolution in Portland. There are a lot of other examples of BDS campaigns. I could talk about this for hours, but I, I will spare you. Um, you can take them up in your university, your union, your church. Pillsbury is a target right now because they make Pillsbury products in the Adara Industrial Zone, which is an illegal settlement. Uh, even members of the Pillsbury family have recently joined the call to boycott Pillsbury, which is incredible. Um, union members have divested their locals from complicit companies and Israeli bonds. Dock workers in San Francisco in the past have taken direct action by refusing to unload Israeli ships. Dock workers in Italy just yesterday actually refused to load weapons onto a ship that was headed to Israel. about BDS is that like so many movements for justice, collective action is so much more powerful than individual action. I see a lot of these lists going around that are like, you know, a list of 100, 200 companies to boycott. And yes, I that's fine. I personally don't buy any Israeli products and, and products from companies who are complicit in Israel. But, but more powerful than that is joining a collective action, picking a target and winning a boycott or a divestment campaign on an organizational or institutional level and holding our elected officials accountable with our tax dollars. Yeah. Those of us who have been doing BDS work and especially Palestinians uh, are used to being attacked and blacklisted and demonized. And whether you're Palestinian, whether you've been doing this work for a while, or you're just now learning about Palestine, I know that it's easy to feel overwhelmed and frozen right now. Uh, but the tide is shifting so rapidly, the time to act is now. It is no longer possible to excuse apartheid and occupation. It is no longer possible for our elected leaders to quietly continue to fund ethnic cleansing. It is no longer possible to call yourself a progressive and defend an apartheid regime. And it is on all of us to help bring the whole thing down. No to annexation! No to occupation! Yes to liberation! Bring, bring the, the whole thing, thing down! No to annexation! Occupation. Yes, the liberation. Bring the whole thing down. No to annexation. 